another video. So today we're going to be going over uh, this post um, called the House of Cards Part 1 and this is written by the username Adabit who is a moderator on the main uh, GameStop Reddit page. So yeah guys, uh, just a reminder, let's leave a like down in the video, subscribe, leave your thoughts on this post down in the comments below. I am going to be doing a giveaway at 50 subscribers, a small amount of Ethereum, and at 100 subscribers I'm going to be doing a Bitcoin giveaway. So that's just going to be chosen at random out of the 50 and 100 subscribers. So, uh, you know, I would highly recommend subscribing because it's going to be coming up soon. Yeah, guys, um, I am basically finished with my setup in here. I'm going to be pumping out uh, more videos, crypto related videos. I'm going to be doing crypto news, uh, my picks for the week, weekly and monthly altcoin picks, um, you know, covering GameStop news, AMC news, stock related news. So, yeah, guys, let's leave uh, some more support on the videos and I'm going to keep pumping them out for you guys. So let's just get started here. Uh, this is just going to be a read loud. I'm going to touch on a couple things, but it's a very long post. So I'm going to try to just get through it for you guys. So the title is the House of Cards Part 1. And it's listed as God Tier DD. The TLDR, which is basically the summary. The DTC has been taken over by big money. They transitioned from a manual to a computerized ledger system in the 80s and it played a significant role in the 1987 market crash. In 2003, several issuers with the DTC wanted to remove their securities from the DTC's deposit account because the DTC's participants were naked short selling their securities. Turns out they were right. The DTC and its participants have created a market sized naked short selling scheme. All of this is made possible by the DTC's enrollee, Seed and Co. Um, okay, so there's he has a, links to his uh, other posts. I will link this in the description below. So if you want to check out some of his other posts, um, I will, uh, the, the link will be in the description below and you can check them out here. Uh, I am going to be doing some more of Adabit's posts. I'm going to be going through them, even older ones, just because they're very important and relevant to the GameStop situation today. So it says, holy sh the events we are living through right now are the 50 year ripple effects of stock market evolution from the birth of the DTC to the cesspool we currently find ourselves in. This DD will illustrate just how fragile the House of Cards has become. We've been warned so many times, we've made this, the same mistakes so many times, and we never seem to learn from them. In case you've been living under a rock for the past few months, the DTCC has been proposing a boatload of rule changes to help better monitor their participants' exposure. If you don't already know, the DTCC stands for the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, and is broken into the following primary subsidi subsidiaries. Number one, Depository Trust Company, DTC, centralized clearing agency that makes sure grandma gets her stonks and the broker receives grandma's tendies. Number two, the National Securities Clearing Corporation, the NSCC, which provides clearing, settlement, risk management, and central counterparty services to its members for broker-to-broker -broker trades. Three, Fixed Income Clearing Corporation, or the FICC which provides central counterparty services to members that participate in the U.S. government and mortgage-backed securities markets. Brief history lesson, I promise it's relevant. Uh, and there's just a link here to, uh, it's a, the DTCC website, and it's basically just history of the DTCC. So the DTC was created in 1973. It stemmed from the need for a centralized clearing company. Trading during the 60s went through the roof and resulted in many brokers having to quit before the day was finished so they could manually record their mountain of transactions. All of this was done on paper and each share certificate was physically delivered. This obviously resulted in many fails to deliver due to the risk of human error and record keeping. In 1974, the continuous net settlement system was launched to clear and settle trades using a rudimentary internet platform. In 1982, the DTC started using a book entry only or BEO system to underwrite bonds. For the first time, there were no physical certificates that actually traded hands. Everything was now performed virtually through computers. Although this was advantageous for many reasons, it made it much easier to commit a certain type of securities fraud, naked shorting. One year later, they adopted NSYE and YSE, pardon me, rule 387, which meant most security transactions had to be completed using this new BEO computer system. Needless to say, 
Explosive growth took place for the next five years. Pretty soon, other securities started utilizing the BEO system. It paved the way for growth in mutual funds and government securities, and even allowed for same-day settlement. At the time, the BEO was such a tremendous achievement. However, we were destined to hit a brick wall after that much growth in such a short time. By October 1987, that's exactly what happened. A number of explanations have been offered as to the cause of the crash. Among these are computer trading, derivative securities, illiquidity, trade and budget deficits, and overvaluation. And that is a quote from um, basically describing what it is what ha- caused the stock market crash of 1987. If you're wondering where the birthplace of high-frequency trading came from, look no further. The same machines that automated the exhaustively manual reconciliation process were also to blame for amplifying the fire sale of 1987. So there's a little graphic here, and uh, it says, uh, it's listing the causes of the 1987 crash. So it says, in searching for the cause of the crash, many analysts blame the use of computer trading by large institutional investing companies. In program trading, computers were programmed to automatically order large stock trades when certain markets when certain market trends prevailed. However, studies show that during the 1987 U.S. crash, other stock markets which did not use the program trading also crashed, some with losses even more severe than the U.S. market. The last sentence indicates a much more pervasive issue is at play here. The fact that we still have trouble, (coughs) excuse me, the fact that we still have trouble explaining the calculus is even more alarming. The effects were so pervasive that it was dubbed the first global financial crisis. Here's another great summary published by the New York Times. To be fair to the computers, they were programmed by fallible people and trusted by people who did not understand the computer program's limitations. As computers came in, human judgment went out. Damned if that didn't give me goosebumps. Here's an extremely relevant explanation from Bruce Bartlett on the role of derivatives. So this is from the same uh, graphic as, as above. Cause 1, derivative securities. Initial blame for the 1987 crash centered on the interplay between stock markets and index options and future markets. In the former, people buy actual shares of the stock. In the latter, they are only purchasing rights to buy or sell stocks at particular prices. Thus, options and futures are known as derivatives because their value derives from changes in stock prices even though no actual shares are owned. The Brady Commission, also known as the Presidential Task Force on Market Mechanisms, which was appointed to investigate the causes of the crash, concluded that the failure of stock markets and derivatives markets to operate in sync was the major factor behind the crash. Notice the last sentence. A major factor behind the crash was a disconnect between the price of the stock and their corresponding derivatives. The value of any given stock should determine the derivative value of that stock. It shouldn't be the other way around. This is an important concept to remember as it will be referenced throughout the post. In the off chance that the market did tank, they hoped they could contain their losses with portfolio insurance. Another article from the New York Times explains this in better detail. Just grab some water, excuse me. So it says portfolio insurance would let them get out with minimal damage if markets ever began to fail. They would simply sell ever increasing numbers of futures contracts, a process known as dynamic hedging. The short position in futures contracts would then offset the losses caused by falls in the stocks they owned. Portfolio insurance did not start the widespread selling of stocks in 1987, but it made sure that the process got out of hand. As computers dictated that more and more futures be sold, the buyers of those futures not only insisted on sharply lowering prices, but also hedged their positions by selling the underlying stocks. That drove prices down further and produced more sell orders from the computers. At the time, many people generally understood how portfolio insurance worked, but there was a belief that its very nature would assure that it could not cause panic. Everyone would know the selling was not coming from anyone with inside information, so others would be willing to step in and buy to take advantage of bargains, or so it was believed. But when the crash arrived, few understood much of anything, except that it was likely nothing we had ever seen. Anyone who did step in with a buy order quickly regretted that decision. A major disconnect occurred when these futures contracts were used to intentionally tank the value of the underlying stock, 
In a perfect world, organic growth would lead to an increase in value of the company. They could do this by selling more products, creating new technologies, breaking into new markets, etc. This would trigger an organic change in the derivatives value because investors would be more optimistic about the longevity of the company. It could go either way, but the point is still the same. This is the type of investing that most of us are familiar with. Investing for a better future. I don't want to spend too much time on the crash of 87. I just want to identify the factors that contributed to the crash and the role of the DTC as they transitioned from a manual to an automatic ledger system. The connection I really want to focus on is the enormous risk appetite these investors had. Think of how overconfident and greedy they must have been to put that much faith in a computer script. Either way, the same problems still exist today. Finally, the comment by Bruce Bartlett regarding the mismatch of investment strategies between stocks and options is crucial in painting the picture of today's market. Now let's do a super brief walkthrough of the main parties within the DTC before opening this can of worms. I'm going to talk about three groups within the DTC. Issuers, Participants, and Seed and Co. Issuers are companies that issue securities or stocks, while participants are the clearinghouses, brokers, and other financial institutions that can utilize those securities. Seed and Co. is a subsidiary of the DTC which holds the share certificates. Participants, with, participants have much more control over the securities that are deposited from the issuer. Even though the issuer created those shares, participants are in control when those shares hit the DTC's doorstep. The DTC transfers those shares to a holding account, or Seed and Co., and the participant just has to ask, "May I have some of? May I have some puri puris with sugar on top?" Now, what's that can of worms? Everything was relatively calm after the crash of '87 until we hit 2003. Deep breath. It actually said that, so <laughs> I figured I'd take the deep breath now while I can. The DTC started receiving several requests from issuers to pull their securities from the DTC's depository. I don't think the DTC was prepared for this because they didn't have a written policy to address it, let alone an official rule. Here's the half-assed response from the DTC. Including its book, uh, I'm sorry. The securities are held by DTC in its nominee name for the benefit of, of its participants. DTC has stated that, in its opinion, these issuers have no legal or beneficial interests in the securities they are requesting to be withdrawn from the DTC. Realizing the situation was heating up, the DTC proposed SR DTC 2003-02. DTC's proposed rule change provides that upon receipt of a withdrawal request from an issuer, DTC will take the following actions. DTC will issue an important notice notifying its participants of the receipt of the withdrawal request from the issuer and remi reminding participants that they can utilize DTC's withdrawal procedures if they wish to withdraw their securities from DTC. And two, DTC will process withdrawal requests submitted by participants in the ordinary course of business but will not effectuate withdrawals based on a request from the issuer. Honestly, they were better off without the new proposal. It became an even bigger deal when word got out about the proposed rule change. Naturally, it triggered a tsunami of comment letters against the DTC's proposal. There was obviously something going on to cause that level of concern. Why did so many issuers want their deposits back? Are you ready for this? As outlined in the DTC's opening remarks, recently a number of issuers of securities have independently requested that DTC withdraw from all depository from the depository all securities issued by them okay see footnote 4 as explained in further detail by many of the commenters opposing DTC's proposal the issuers making these requests have alleged that their securities have been the target of manipulative short sellers uh what yeah i'd be pretty pissed too have my shares deposited in a clearing company to take advantage of their computerized trades just to get kicked it to the curve with no way of getting my securities back, and then to find out that the big D participants at your fancy DTC party are literally short selling my shares without me knowing? This sounds familiar, anyone? I don't know about y'all, but this trust us with your shares BS is starting to sound like a major con. The DTC asked for feedback from all issuers and participants to gather a consensus before making a decision. 
Altogether, the DTC received 89 comment letters, a pretty big response. 47 of those letters opposed the rule change, while 35 were in favor. To save space, I'm going to use smaller screenshots. Da, da, da. So this is a uh, letter f to Senator Lieberman, I guess. So it says, uh, we were writing to enlist your support of our request to the SEC to conduct an investigation into naked short selling of, small, of shares of small cap companies on the OTCBB. And another, this, these are all just letter, uh, emails and letters to people. So this is another one. It says, as an investor who has been continually burned by an inefficient and poorly organized DTC as relates to naked short selling, I urge you to allow companies to continue to withdraw from the DTC at their discretion. And there's another one that says this rule should not be passed because by permitting the settlement of so-called short trades by traders not holding share certificates, the DTC has shown itself to be incompetent to uphold the law and stop illegal naked short selling. If not complicit in such practices and therefore a company's only protection from an attack on its stock by such criminal activity may be to withdraw unilaterally from the DTC settlement system. So basically the point of these guys is, uh, you know, people knew that there was some shady stuff going on with the DTC. They were uh, basically trading shares that they didn't own. So that's pretty shady. Yeah. So here are a few in favor. Uh, all the comments. So there, here's some examples of uh, people that were in favor of it. So all the comments I checked were participants and, and classified as market makers and other major financial institutions. Go figure. So they were banks and hedge funds basically that wanted the rule to be passed. So here's the full list if you want to dig on your own. So this link will be here if you guys want to check it out. I realize there are advantages to paperless securities transfers. However, it is exactly what Michael Sandow said in his comment letter above. We simply cannot trust the DTC to protect our interests when we don't have physical control of our assets. Several other participants, including Edward Jones, Ameritrade, Citibank, and Prudential, overwhelmingly favored this proposal. How can someone not acknowledge that the absence of physical shares only makes it easier for those people to manipulate the market? This rule change would allow these participants to continue doing this because it's extremely profitable to sell shares that don't exist or have not been collateralized. Furthermore, it's a win-win for them because it forces issuers to keep their deposits in the holding account of the DTC. Ever heard of the fractional reserve banking system? Sounds a lot like what the stock market has just become. Want proof of market manipulation? Let's fact check the claims from the opposition letters above. I'm only reporting a, f a few of them. This is just to validate their claims that some sketchy sh is going on. So this is just, uh, there's links to the companies that were in favor of the uh, DTCC rule. Ironically, I picked these three because they were the first going down the line. I'm not sure had to be any more objective about this. Their entire FINRA report is littered with short sale violations. Before anyone asks, how, did, how do you know they all aren't like that? The answer is, I checked. If you get caught for a short sale violation, chances are you will always get caught for short sale violations. Why? Because it's profitable to do it and get caught. It's more profitable to do it and get caught than it is to fix the problem. Want to know the second worst part? Several comments later, several comment letters asked the DTC to investigate the claims of naked shorting before coming to a decision on the proposal. I never saw a document where they followed up on these requests. Now want to know the worst part? It is it is therefore ordered that the proposed rule change be and hereby is approved. The DTC passed the rule change. They not only prevented the issuers from removing their, their deposits, but they also turned a blind eye to their participants manipulatively short selling, even when there is public evidence of them doing so. Those companies were being attacked with shares they put into the DTC by institutions they can't even identify. Let's take a quick breath and recap. The DTC started using a computerized ledger and was very successful through the 80s. This evolved into trading systems that were also computerized, but not as sophisticated as they hoped. They played a major part in the 1987 crash along with severely desynchronized derivatives trading. In 2003, the DTC denied issuers the right to withdraw their deposits because those securities were in control of participants instead. When issuer A deposits stock into D the DTC, and participant B shorts those shares into the market, there's a form of rehypothecation. This is why so many issuers were trying to express in their comments 
In addition, it hurts their company by driving down its value. They felt robbed because the DTC was blatantly allowing its participants to do this and refused to give them back their shares. It was critically important for me to paint that background. Now then, remember when I mentioned the DTC's enrollee, Seed & Co? I'll admit it, I didn't think that, that they were relevant. I focused so much on the DTC that I didn't think to check into their enrollee, which I did. So there's an article, a screenshot here, it says you don't really own your securities. Can blockchains fix that? And the highlighted section says it is not owned by the ostensible owners who, by virtue of having purchased shares in this or that company, are led to believe they actually own the shares. Technically, all they own are IOUs. The true ownership lies elsewhere. Nearly all publicly traded equities and a majority of bonds are owned by a little-known partnership, Seed & Co., which is the nominee of the, of the DTC. For each security, Seed & Co. owns a master certificate known as the Global Security, which never leaves its fault. Transactions are recorded as debits and credits to DTC members. Securities accounts, but the registered owner of the security, Seed & Co., remains the same. That's right, Seed & Co. hold a master certificate in their vault which never leaves. Instead, they issue an IOU for that master certificate. Didn't we just talk about why this is such a major flaw in our system, and that was almost 20 years ago? Here comes the next mind F. So there's another screenshot from a different article. It says, uh, it's titled, Illegal Naked Shorting Series, Who or What is Seed & Co., and What Role Do They Play in the Trading of Stocks? When you buy a stock, you are actually purchasing a security that affords certain entitlement rights related to registered stock, which actual owners hold. Seed is a subsidiary of the DTC, which is a subsidiary of the DTCC, and the DTCC is a private company owned by elite Wall Street firms and money center banks. If you need a background or a refresher on DTC and DTCC, da da da, effectively elite Wall Street firms and money center banks not institutions and individual investors, own almost all of the registered shares of publicly traded companies in the U.S. While you may think that you are buying a registered stock, you are actually buying a financial derivative related to that stock. Effectively, you are buying a financial derivative from brokers of a financial derivative they hold from Seed & Co. That is just a digital entry in your DTC account. Now, you want to know the best part? I found a list of all the DTC participants that are responsible for this mess. I've got your name, number, and I'm coming for you. All of you. Whew. And then it's to be continued from there, guys. Uh, so we are waiting for part two. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just want to read a couple of the top comments out to you guys because I think they're super interesting. Um, so this top comment here says, so they built a broken system on top of a broken system that didn't work as well as they'd hoped and then regulated the system in favor of the people breaking the system. And the whole thing got exposed because of an overconfident shorts and, insane, and an insane YOLO. Holy moly. And then below that, someone said, not only that, but it's really hard to argue that this doesn't have all the hallmarks of a criminal conspiracy simply based on part one. And that's the basis of the entire U.S. stock market, which has irrevocable repercussions on the entire world. <laughs> so, yeah, guys, uh, I am kind of out of breath. My mouth is dry. But as soon as uh, part two comes out, as soon as Adabit publishes part two of uh, House of Cards, I'm going to do a uh, read aloud for you guys. Uh, I think this information is really interesting. Um, I know to some people this might sound kind of conspiratorial, but I have uh, read into looked up some of the stuff. I have looked into it. And, uh, you know, Adabit is correct, and he's he's a great ape. He's done a lot of research. Um, you know, he's a smart guy. So, uh, yeah, guys, I will be doing more posts by him. Um, and, uh, yeah, guys, let's leave some likes on the video. Uh, let's leave some comments. Leave your thoughts down below on where you think GameStop is headed. Leave your thoughts on this, uh, this read aloud that we did today. Uh, so definitely subscribe to the channel. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a giveaway. Um, yeah, guys, with that being said, I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of your day.